Welcome to Forum 360, where we have a global outlook from a local view. I'm your host, Leah Love, and today we have Dr. Teresa Myers with us. Um, just to give you a brief background about what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk a little bit more about hair loss and about the latest innovations of hair loss um, technologies. But for me, what drew me to this subject was um, a couple years ago, I woke up and I took out my hair and I had a big hole in the top of my head. Um, as a hairstylist, I come across women who lose their hair and it's usually just been determined that it's because of genetics or just because they're aging. Uh, well, neither one of those was a factor for me, so that caused me to go in and try to figure out what was actually happening. I went to the doctors, they really couldn't tell me what it was. They said, you know, you have a full head of hair, you're fine, your vitals, everything is okay. Um, the biggest thing for me was that I really had this sense of losing hope, you know, and then of course you lose your confidence because everybody's looking at this hole in your head or because your hair is really, really thin. Um, so that set me on the path of trichology, which is the study of the scalp diseases and disorders. Um, from there, I learned that a lot of internal things cause hair loss that comes out on the outside that's not just genetic or hereditary. So we have a physician with us, a family medicine physician, and she is going to dive into this. And I just absolutely love her because she has such compassion for her patients and she really goes that extra mile for making sure that she can service them to the best of her ability. So tell me a little bit about you, um, your background and how you even got into medicine. Well, thank you, Dr. Love, for having me. I absolutely love you too. <laughs> so, um, excuse me, I have a little cold. So um, basically, um, as a family medicine physician, I've been practicing for about 14 years. And um, why I got into medicine was, I was told from childhood, I all, that's all, all I said I wanted to be was a doctor. Mm -hmm. And um, I just followed that, uh, pursued that dream and um, followed the direction of God. And I feel like he put me in a place to fulfill uh, the, the will of on my life uh, and the mission of service in medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I became a physician. Why family medicine? Well, when I was in medical school, every rotation that I did, I loved. And um, I, it didn't matter what it was, I loved everything. And so my counselor says, you need to be family medicine. And so um, family medicine actually deals with the care of everyone from birth to death. And it deals with the care of the person totality, meaning like from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet. There is nothing that we don't address in family medicine. And because I loved everything, that's why I pursued that. And I felt that I could have the biggest impact on um, chronic disease management and the overall wellness of a person uh, going into family medicine. Okay. Um, so how did you get involved with hair loss? So it's very interesting, it's this two-fold answer. Um, first and foremost, as a, a family medicine physician, we're sometimes considered the, the first point of contact when someone uh, loses their hair. Just like you said, you went to the physician and you said, hey, you know, what's going on with my hair? And uh, a lot of times, um, believe it or not, in, in medical school, you're not taught a lot about hair loss. And many physicians will, uh, particularly primary care physicians, will refer to dermatologists uh, to address hair loss. And I had a lot of patients come in saying, you know, what's going on with my hair, just like with you. And I would refer sometimes to dermatology, but dermatologists are very busy. <laughs> and I don't know if anyone's recently tried to get an appointment, but sometimes it's going to be six months. And, and anyone I know who's acutely lost hair is not waiting six months right, to deal with right. it. So I was kind of forced to pretty much go back to school and learn about uh, various types of hair loss and how to treat it so that I can um, actually apply uh, the medicine that I learned to patient care. And the second part of the story is you. Mm -hmm. um, you came into my life, I think as a patient initially, and we bonded and you are, became interested in this based off your story and you kind of pulled me into <laughs> <laughs> doing a little bit more than what I expected to do. Um, and I'm grateful for it because I feel that any time in life that you're offered an opportunity to expand your knowledge and help more people, you need to grab a hold and run with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what we do. 
And I think the more people that you have involved in addressing an issue, the better outcome you have as far as when you're collaborating. Not having a whole lot of people doing a lot of different things, but people coming together, collaborating on um, achieving the goal of a certain problem. So you brought me into hair restoration a lot, a lot further along than what I was doing as a, a family medicine physician individually. And, and let me back up and say that <clears throat> When I was first beginning out, I did not know you. So that was the reason why she wasn't one of the doctors who said, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> I found her later into my journey. Of thank hair you for loss that. And hair restoration. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. But I'm not but just to, just to be clear, I'm yeah. I'm not the type of doctor who um, who doesn't uh, admit if there is something that they don't know because mm -hmm. I, I I agree that mm -hmm. um, it is important to know that you know you have confidence in the person that you're right. seeing and, and to say enough that I don't know but I am not the one to stop there right. I will go and learn and right. figure it out and then we'll come back together and address it but no absolutely. I wasn't the original absolutely <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's get into the good stuff what yes. is PRP and what does PRP mean so PRP is an acronym for platelet rich plasma and so the best way to explain that is to break the words down and this is kind of how I learned and everything that I did is I always have to break things down I'm, I'm not one of those you know geniuses who could just absorb things I break everything down and use all kind of um, analogies but so if we start with the last word plasma most people say well what is plasma well basically blood okay when you get your blood drawn um, it involves liquid and the liquid part of blood is plasma. What um, makes it flow is mostly water. Um, and it has some solids in it. And those solids are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And the nutrients in the plasma um, are things like oxygen and glucose, which is sugar, and electrolytes like sodium, potassium, and you have all kind of wonderful proteins, and you have um, collagen and growth factors, and you have um, uh, clotting factors, all kinds of things that bathe your cells in this wonderful nutrient environment. So um, if you wanted to use an analogy of what it would look like, if you took... Um, if you took an ice cube and you had a cup of water and you dropped the ice cube in the water, the water is the plasma, the ice cube is, is different things like platelets and, and blood cells and so forth. Okay. And so um, what we do with that is we separate the plasma, with, which has all the nutrients in it, and the platelets, which have wonderful growth factors in it, and we separate it from the solid part, like the red blood cells and white blood cells, and uh, we use that to help regenerate and grow hair. And so platelet rich means that you have a sample that is rich with, has lots of wonderful growth enhancing platelets in it. And so that's what we use to help your body naturally regenerate hair. Ah, so how does it work? How does the actual procedure in the process work? Okay, so first of all, what we do is when you come in, we would draw your blood. Well, beyond assessing your hair and figuring out, and we'll talk about that later, but if you're a candidate for PRP, you will have a blood draw. And the blood draw is very similar to when you go to have your blood draw for your regular checkup from your primary care physician. The uh, blood draws a small amount of blood, and we actually put it in a centrifuge. Centrifuge is kind of, of a, 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 a spinning... Um, separator okay of cells mm -hmm. so it spins the blood really fast and it separates the solids from the liquid so the blood cells uh, red blood cells and white blood cells from the plasma mm -hmm. okay and that plasma is a rich amount of platelets which has all the growth factors and that's what we use to um, treat you the next step would be to really thoroughly clean the scalp in the area that we're treating and then we will numb that area um, with a lot of times we'll do a block which would numb the whole scalp. And then, and you don't feel any pain after that. And then we would inject. I know that's everybody's first question. Yes. Is it gonna hurt? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I'll tell you how I learned that part. <laughs> but, um, but after we, we numb you up and make sure your scalp is really clean, then we can inject. Um, there's multiple ways of using it. As by the way, you'll see lots of different um, uh, companies out there or um, uh, organizations that does it differently. but. For the most part, the goal is to get the plasma into the, the, the damaged tissue. And you can do that by 
bathing it after microblading, which is little tiny holes, or directly injecting it into the area with a needle. And um, it's, there's no downtime. It's, it, you can go home, drive, do anything. There's nothing sedating. And um, most people don't, it's very minimal to no pain. Okay. And uh, pretty much that's the process. That's the process. Mm -hmm. Clean and simple. Um, how many treatments are required? So depending on the condition that you have and um, the, the degree of chronicity, how long and how bad the, the condition is, determines that. If you have something, a really small spot and it was very minimal and we may only need to treat it one time, mm -hmm. but there are some people who have a large area and it's been going on for a long time, years and so forth, and we may need to do two to three treatments a year. And we may even to do be able to do annual uh, treatments follow to follow up to keep the hair you know, at its best. So, right. so it just depends on the condition. On the condition. Um, are the results immediate? Like what's the time frame that you're looking at for to see some results? So first of all, let me put out a disclaimer. Okay. I am only speaking for myself. Right, right. <laughs> not all right. doctors are, in, are not all <laughs> practitioners who practice PRP. Um, I can only speak for the results that I have seen. I have seen results it's as early as two weeks, seeing little stubble of hair growth come back. However, literature says that it takes about three to four weeks for the cells to regenerate and, and grow. You stimulate the stem cells for your hair and the hair follicles for it to grow. So I would say on average three to four weeks was when you start seeing some. There are some people who will see earlier and some people later. Later, okay. And if you are just joining us, we're talking to Dr. Teresa Myers, who is a family medicine physician, and we're talking about the latest innovation in hair growth, which is PRP. So, um, are there any risks with this procedure? So yes, there are risks. Um, anytime you penetrate the skin, there's a risk of infection, and that's probably the top of the list as far as what the risk would be. And that's why it's very important to make sure the scalp is very clean. This is not a, a this is not a sterile procedure. It's a clean procedure, which means that it's important to make sure the that you you get any kind of debris and, and dirt or you know we all have carry some cells, uh, um, bacteria and things on our skin and surfaces. So you don't want to inject that into uh, underneath the skin. So you want to make sure it's clean. But the probably the risk that we would be most concerned about is infection. Other than that, there, there aren't any other risks. No, no other risks. Yeah. Good, good. Um, okay, so we know that it's not painful. <laughs> that, that's very minimal. <laughs> Can you use other therapies um, concurrently or at the same time with this? Absolutely, and in, in most cases, it, it actually is recommended um, to use you know, other therapies. One of the reasons why I like our um, partnership is because of the fact that Taking care of your hair in general is important. Things like nutrients, and sometimes you may need laser treatment. Um, sometimes you may need other FDA-approved um, therapies like DHT blockers, and um, some people- Can you tell us what DHT blockers are? So basically, um, there are hormones that we have that are uh, testosterone based that can sometimes um, cause an attack on the hair follicles. And if you have an excess of that, then it can actually cause something like a male pattern baldness. And if you block the excess, then you decrease the risk of, of, of the attack on the follicle. Okay. And so that's what that is. Um, and, and so there are many modalities of ta attacking this and it really is individual there is no one treatment specific for every person. Each person has to have uh, a, a physician, in my opinion, a physician, a, a trichologist or hair um, dress a stylist to come together to figure out the best treatment for them. And most of it involves a combination of, of modalities. You know, I really like that you say that you need to have a good team mm -hmm. because this is not just a one problem or one size fits all solution mm -hmm. that you're gonna have to have. So having the different experts around your team are gonna make sure you have the optimal results that you're looking for. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah awesome. <laughs> all right, so are there any um, results that are different with men versus women? Well, um, the results are basically depending on the underlying cause. 
And men and women have sometimes different underlying causes, but most of the time the cause is very similar. Okay. The outcome, you know, is the same across the board, depending on if you choose the right modality for the right problem, mm -hmm. you'll get good outcomes, right. <laughs> whether you're male or female. <laughs> uh, when is it not recommended for somebody? When are they not a candidate? So this is why it's important to have a, lot, a, a team of people involved because there are certain medical conditions um, that I would not recommend PRP for. Um, for instance, if, if someone you know, was a heavy smoker, if they um, did drugs or a heavy alcohol drinker, if they had some underlying conditions that um, uh, were platelet dysfunction conditions, um, some metabolic decisions. Um, so you said a heavy smoker, mm -hmm. that would cause a platelet dysfunction? So it can, but what, what that does too is decrease your ability to heal. And so the thing that we're trying to do is encourage your, your body to naturally heal itself. But when you smoke, your body doesn't heal very well. And so therefore you, you're fighting an uphill battle. So if you can get the person to stop smoking, increase their general health. And this is why I'm saying it's not, a, it's not as simple as going and just getting a treatment and right. buying a package. Right. It really is looking at the total body as a unit and getting the body, the best time you get the best results is getting the body healthy first, finding out the cause inside. Your hair, your skin, your nail is basically screaming that there's something going on mm -hmm. insi inside. And if you just treat the surface, you're not getting to the cause. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get to the cause, then that means that the, the results are temporary. And, and there, it's like a Band-Aid over, like say, a bullet room. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that it's important to understand the underlying cause before you can say what the result will be. And, that, and if stopping smoking will help you to regenerate your ability to heal, that's going to make your outcome better. So the first thing I would do with someone who came to me was a heavy smoker and wanted PRP, it was like, okay, let's first start with helping you stop smoking because this is gonna be more effective after you stop smoking than it is now. And I don't want you to waste your money. Right, yeah. right, right. That's good to know. Um, so let's talk about, we hear the term, alopecia all the time. Mm -hmm. um, can you put that in a layman's term and, and then even just describe to us the different types that you know are out there that people may be experiencing? So alopecia basically just means hair loss. Okay. That's it. It's just a fancy medical term. Right. We always have to use our fancy <laughs> medical terms. <laughs> we could just simply say hair loss. Hair loss. <laughs> but there, but there are categories of hair loss, and alopecia itself, they do have a category of alopecia. And it ranges from um, the most common, and I, I would say that the most common would be androgenic alopecia. Androgenic alopecia is simply male or female pattern hair baldness. And basically, it's usually the crown of the head that people see in, in, in various uh, um, gradients. And um, it usually is caused by a hormonal change and sometimes genetic. Mm -hmm. And well, most of the time genetic, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, that's probably the most common. And then you have other ones that are common, like um, alopecia areata, which is probably similar to what you experienced. Mm -hmm. And it usually is a small circular patch mm -hmm. of the hair, and it's a very clean surface, and it's just like someone snatched the hair out and, and you know, while you were sleeping. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like it looked like somebody just shaved yes. a clean spot in yes, my head, and exactly. I'm like, where's the hair? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so that happens a lot for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, and most of the times the hair comes back and with some treatment. And so that's a, that's a, a great uh, benefit. But we see that in all all ages, all you know, genders across the board. Um, then you have um, alopecia totalis, which is when you lose all the hair on the scalp itself. And, um, and then there's, there's alopecia universalis, which is uh, all the hair on the scalp and on the body as well. And then you have, um, there's specific ones like um, traction alopecia, and you'll see that with um, anyone who has a continuous pulling of the hair, like up in a ponytail or uh, using lots of braids and so forth, and you'll see the edges a lot of I times. I see that a lot in yes, the salon. Yes, in the salon, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> that constant tension pulls in a, on the follicle, and it uh, disrupts it, its ability to regenerate and so forth. It can cause the hair to, uh, to fall out. Um, and, and, and these, all of the ones that I mentioned, with, with the exception of universalis and totalis, 
you, you can actually treat with um, PRP. Now there are, a, a, I can go through a long list of other right. types of alopecia, common. but those are the ones that are most common that we'll see either in the office or in, in the salon. Now, um, you said not treatable. So if somebody is not a candidate and maybe they have totalis or universalis, what would be another option for them where you could still give them, you know, some type of hope or, mm -hmm. you know, confidence in what they're, they're wearing? Absolutely. So there are various um, units that you can use. Um, one being you can use um, custom-made wigs, um, and that's... Um, very uh, unique to you because that's what custom made is. Um, probably not as expensive as the second option, which would be um, your cranial prosthesis, which is very um, unique to you and maybe a little bit more expensive, but it can be um, it can be produced in a way that it more natural mm -hmm. and um, bring about a lot more confidence. But either is effective. Yeah, I have found that the, the actually the most natural, of course, is gonna be the cranial prosthesis. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the custom units now are also looking just as natural mm -hmm. too. So it really, you know, depending on your budget yes. of what you wanna do, and sometimes your insurance can reimburse you for Absolutely. the cranial prosthesis unit. Absolutely, we as physicians can write for cranial prosthesis, so then if, if that takes the the, um, the the finance issue off the table, mm -hmm. um, then like you said, that is probably the more natural way to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you do that. Yes, which yes, is awesome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what have you seen um, just on the emotional side with men and women? Like some of the things that they feel like they've experienced, you know, in, in terms of their psyche kind of. So, you know, culturally, um, everyone has uh, an opinion about what hair does for you. And in women, probably more so, you know, the men, it can actually affect your emotional um, uh, status as far as, you know, uh, does it cause you anxiety? Does it cause uh, shame or does it decrease your self-esteem? I've seen that, you know, across the board in men and women. And um, it is important to first and foremost uh, help people to understand that uh, embracing you as you, as God made you, is first and foremost um, important. And I know it seems you know, trite and so forth, but it really is important to accept you and not try to be or reproduce someone else. Right. Like I tell people all the time, don't bring me a picture of Fair Fawcett when you rock and Sade, okay? <laughs> because, <laughs> because that's just not you. Yeah. You, you gotta yeah. be you. Yeah. But, but the shame of it, I think, comes when society doesn't accept people for who they are or they pr produce images of what we supp we're supposed to look like. And so I think that it's more important to not only address getting you back to the natural way God made you, but also to address how you accept you and not letting anyone else determine your worth, your esteem, and um, your emotional well-being. So if you don't address everything, you're just really only patch doing patchwork. I can make your hair grow back. You can make their hair grow back. Mm -hmm. But if th the underlying cause of what brought you to that level of shame is not addressed, then we're only doing part of the work. Yeah. So yes, I have seen that. And I, I try to address both, not just, oh yeah, let's get your hair back. Yes, we're gonna get your hair back. But let's make sure that there aren't other causes as to why um, the shame causes you distress. Right, right. You know, um, somebody who's a young person who wants to go into your field, you know, real quick, if you could give them like 30 seconds, what would you tell them? Well, <clears throat> I would say first and foremost, make sure in the core of your core that that's what you want to do. Because once you start on this path, it's hard to get off the path. And you don't want to go into the field if it's not in your heart or if it's not, in my opinion, the will of God for you to do this. Because it's very hard work, it's very demanding, and it requires a lot of compassion, patience, 
and um, diligent. You got to work hard. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, don't, if you do feel that this is it, don't be afraid to just go for it. Because if it's meant for you to be, you will be, and nothing can stop you from doing it. Uh, don't put greed <laughs> ahead of <laughs> compassion. Yeah. Because I think that's where a lot of times people get lost, and not just in the field of medicine, but all in all over. fields. Yeah. If you're chasing the dollar, you completely forget about the purpose for which you exist. And if you chase compassion, if you really try to care, the dollar will come. It will. Yeah. It will. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. She taught us so much today, everyone. I hope you learned. Um, a gamut of information. <laughs> um, but really, you were able to see um, her pure heart for it. So we want to thank you, Dr. Myers, you, for Dr. coming Love. out and sharing your expertise with us. Again, my name is Leah Love. I'm your host. And thank you for joining us on Forum 360, where we have a global outlook from a local view. Forum 360 is brought to you by Electrical Impulse Communications, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, an anonymous donor, the Jewish Community Board of Akron, Medical Mutual of Ohio, Blue Green, and Forum 360 supporters.